Now, I want to tell you a story about when my daughter, our daughter, Karis, was four years old. And she got the opportunity to be a part of a program at her school called Transition Kindergarten. Now, her precious TK teacher thought that it would be a great idea to teach all the children a song called The Farmer in the Dell. Now, this particular song has an infinite number of verses. And I think Karis learned about nine of those verses. And Karis loved to sing this song when we were in the minivan together, all nine verses. And for me, when it was just me and Karis, it was really it was really cute, and I, I actually enjoyed it because what mama doesn't love to hear her little four-year-old sing songs in the car seat. But when other people, other family members were added to the minivan equation, the situation went south real quick. Because you see, Karis felt very compelled to sing all nine verses, and she had to sing them without interruption, and no one else was allowed to join in. And so her older brothers caught on to this scenario real quick, and they suddenly became very interested in also singing The Farmer in the Dell. And so right around verse five, they would just join her. And this would lead to like weeping and gnashing of teeth, and we would have to start all over at the beginning. I'm like, boys, you are shooting yourself in the foot here. This is like self-inflicted punishment. You just gotta let her close the loop. We all learned that the fastest, most efficient way to get through this minivan moment was just let Karis finish the song, close the loop, right? There's something in our brains that just longs to close the loop. Like if you get a a lyric, a music lyric stuck in your head, the best way to get it out is just sing the whole song. Or like if I see a movie like three quarters of the way through and it's just the dumbest, most stupid movie, I'm still going to finish the movie because I got to know how it ends, right? Like my brain wants resolution. Our brains are like craving this predictability and equilibrium. And so whenever there's unfinished business in our life or things that are unknown, we just are always seeking to close the loop. The problem with that is that so much of life is lived in what Andy refers to as the zone of the unknown, Like we just, we live in spaces of ambiguity. Uh, We live in a lot of uncertainty where we don't know what's right around the corner for us. Our, Our future feels so foggy to us a lot of the time. And so it creates this sense of anxiety in us because it feels so uncertain. Well, this whole series, we're talking about peace and God's promise for us that he wants to give us peace. But so few of us are living with peace. And every week in this series, we're, we're kind of breaking that down. Why is that? that? That God's promised us peace, but most of us aren't experiencing peace. Like if I was to ask for a show of hands, which I'm not, but if I did, then, and I said, how many of you even this week just experienced some pretty high levels of anxiety about something in your life? Probably most of the hands in this room would go up because so many, of like we're just, all dealing with stress and anxiety that life brings. And so what are the barriers that are keeping us from being able to experience the peace of God in our lives? Well, last week, Andy opened up this message series, and if you didn't get a chance to listen to Andy's message, I wanna encourage you this week to go back and listen to it because he gives us a framework for understanding God's promise of peace. And the thing he focuses in on is our identity and how a lot of confusion around our identity and who God created us to be is a huge barrier for us to be able to experience the peace that God offers us. And today we wanna look at it from the angle of uncertainty and how a lot of times those uncertain spaces in our life where we're just like, I don't know what to do here, that can create anxiety for us. But it's, it's not a requirement because, listen, my premise for us today is that you can have uncertainty in your life, but it does not require you to also have a lack of peace in your life. In fact, you can be full of uncertainty, and it would be possible at the very same time to be full of faith and full of peace. I remember one time in my life where I was feeling so much uncertainty about my future when I was 
making that decision about where to go to college back when I was a senior in high school. I know we've got a lot of students here at Saddleback Church and that junior and senior year, man, you're just wrestling through this decision about what is next. And it felt, it felt so significant to me. It felt like my entire life hinged on this decision. And what if I made the wrong one? Like what, I would just end up somewhere I'm not supposed to be. It felt like such a big decision. And so it feels like in moments like that where you're not sure what to do, the only possible solution is that anxiety is going to come in. But what, what we want to look at today is that there's actually a pathway to peace through these moments of, of uncertainty. And we're going to look at a, a story in the Bible where someone was given a really dif some difficult news and an uncertain circumstance, and they had to navigate it. We're gonna watch them navigate this journey of uncertainty with peace. This story is a bit of like a prototype for us, like an example for how we can navigate all of life's uncertainty with the peace of God in our lives. And so I want us to look at a book of Second Chronicles together, chapter 20. And just to give you a little bit of background on this story, it's when Israel has already been divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And in the southern kingdom, there's a king by the name of Jehoshaphat, which is like a cool name, right? I was hoping that maybe some of you would volunteer to name your next child Jehoshaphat because it's such a legendary name. And um, so Jehoshaphat is the king in this story. And so we're gonna story tell through this passage. And then after we do that, we're gonna, we're gonna pull out and do some principles that we can each apply to our lives in those areas of uncertainty. If I ask you right now to turn to your neighbor and tell them, what is the area of uncertainty that you're facing right now in your life? All of us would have something because none of us can see into the future. We all have decisions that we're making. We have relationships that feel like they're in limbo. And so all of us have these uncertainties in our life. And as we look at this passage and the principles that we can draw from it, I hope that you'll keep that at the front of your mind because I believe that's exactly where God wants to meet you today, in that place of uncertainty, and he wants to bring peace even there. So let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 20 with Jehoshaphat. It says in verse two that some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. And in fact, it's already here. It's already on this side of the sea. It's over in Engedi, just 25 miles to the southeast. And so it says, alarmed, Jehoshaphat, dot, dot, dot. Now, what is Jehoshaphat gonna do? He's the king. He's the commander in chief. All eyes are on him. He's gotta figure out a solution real, qu real quick because this is like, this is like a crisis, right? You can't just sit by and do nothing. You gotta figure it out when you're the leader. You gotta do something. What would you do in this situation? What would you do when you get handed a crisis and everything suddenly feels very uncertain? Like if a doctor comes in and he gives you a bad report and he says to you, what, what form of treatment do you wanna pursue? And you're like, I don't know. This is a crisis. I have, I have no idea what to do. Or what do you do if you find out that your junior high daughter is cutting and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a crisis. We've never been here before. I don't know what to do. Or maybe it's something that you're facing at work and it's just a decision that you have to make or it's like a situation with one of your colleagues or, a, or an employee that you're dealing with and you're like, I don't know what to do in this moment. How do you handle that? A lot of times we kind of have a freak out moment, don't we, where we just panic on the inside and then maybe we phone a friend or we're gonna call a mentor. Maybe you write out your pros and cons list. You're gonna whiteboard out a strategy. You're gonna hire a consultant. We go into action mode whenever a crisis hits because our brains are desperate for resolution, are desperate for a solution. And let's see how Jehoshaphat handles this moment of uncertainty. It says, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. Now, we're in church, so that feels like the right answer, right? Like, good job, Jehoshaphat. You made the right choice. Re inquire of the Lord. But if you're Jehoshaphat's advisor, you're like, bro, 
We're going to war. There ain't no time for your holy huddle right now. We gotta move into action. You're the commander in chief. Everybody's eyes are on you. You gotta do something, bro. Call the generals together. Let's rally the troops. We need to gather some supplies. It's pretty obvious, Jehoshaphat, what the next step is, what the Lord's will is, Jehoshaphat. Let's go, it's game time. And so it feels very counterintuitive for Jehoshaphat to resolve to inquire of the Lord. Why was that? Why did he feel so compelled that that was the first thing he needed to do? Well, if you would rewind 2 Chronicles a couple of chapters, you would read a story about Jehoshaphat's epic fail, how he had entered into a different battle and he had not heeded the Lord's instruction and he suffered tremendous losses. He actually almost lost his own life in that battle. And Jehoshaphat's like, I'm not making that mistake again. This time I'm gonna inquire of the Lord first because I don't wanna enter into a battle that he hasn't asked me to enter into. And so he has resolved that he's going to inquire of the Lord. And not only that, it says that he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. Now this is an entire country. Can you imagine this? How, how do you think this was received? Imagine if the, United, the president of the United States just comes on and he's like, all right, Americans, I'm proclaiming a fast. And let me tell you, this is not a social media fast that we're doing here together. Nobody's eating today. And you're like, excuse me? Like that is not gonna be a very popular command, right? And so that, that is what Jehoshaphat does. He says, we are all going to fast and seek the Lord together. Now listen, I have a whole little soapbox that I like to get on about fasting and how it's this lost spiritual discipline that we need to revitalize in our generation. But I'll just tell you, it's not very popular, so I'm gonna keep it to myself today. <laughs> However, I will say this. You will think, you would think that the most strategic path forward would be that they would want their fighting men to be as physically strong as they could possibly be when they enter into battle. Like you would want them to get the proper nutrition, let's fatten these guys up before we send them out. But somehow Jehoshaphat realizes that it's not going to be through their own physical strength that this battle is gonna be won. You see, fasting takes us to a place of weakness, a place where we recognize our own hunger deep inside of us, where we recognize our need, our dependence upon God. And when we get to that place of desperate need, we are open and we are ready to receive the supernatural intervention of God. And so all of Judah fasts together and it says in verse four that the people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Isn't that so beautiful? Just a, a whole nation coming together to seek the Lord collectively. Just imagine a whole church standing before the Lord collectively seeking his face. In verse five it says, Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and he's going to pray. Now I want you to in your mind visualize this king and he's probably in royal robes and his crown on his head and he's standing in front of all of his people that he leads and he's looking very kingly up there. He's looking very other than. But we're gonna see him humble himself before the Lord He's gonna humble himself before these people that he leads and he's gonna inquire of God what to do. The first thing that we're gonna see in this prayer is how he reminds himself of God's power. Look at this verse, it says, "'Oh Lord, God of our fathers, "'are you not the God who is in heaven? "'You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. "'Power and might are in your hand "'and no one can withstand you.'" Friend, when you are bumping up against a crisis in your life, when you're bumping up against some unforeseen future, some circumstances that just feel foggy and you feel, you feel fearful, it is good for us to remind our hearts that we have a God who is in control, that we have a God who is seated high and above on his throne and power and might are in his hand. It's good for us to remember that any situation that feels over our head is under his feet and he's got this. He is in control and you can trust him because he is more than able. Not only does Jehoshaphat remind himself that God is powerful and he's more than enough, he also is going to remind God of his promise 
He's gonna hold up the promises of God right before God and say, God, remember you said this. He's actually gonna invoke some covenantal language, reaching all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 when God promised to Abraham that he was going to give Abraham and his descendants this land, this promised land. Let's look in this verse together. It says, oh, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. They've lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. You see, this is, the, this is the essence of prayer and supplication. When we come before God, we can bring with us the promises that he's already given us, that God, this is who you say that you are. This is who, what you've said that you're gonna do. And so I'm standing on your promise. I'm bringing it to you and reminding you of it because you said it and I know that you're faithful. He who promised is faithful and he will do it. So I'm gonna wait in expectation that you will be true to your word, God. This is your promise to me. I mean, when you're going through uncertainty, it is good for you to have some promises of God to cling to, to anchor your soul. You need a more sturdy foundation than the uncertainty of what you're going through at the time. But I don't know about you, whenever I bump up against a crisis, a lot of times it feels like I completely forget every single Bible verse I've ever known in my whole life. Like I just, my mind goes blank. I'm like, what is it that I believe again? I just can't remember anymore. So what our team did is we put together some promises from God to you that you can cling to in moments of uncertainty. We wanna give this to you. And so we, we did a little downloadable thing that you're gonna get today when you check in with us. It's gonna come on the screen, I believe. Yes, here we go. Okay, so you can, you can get this today. When you check in with us, you can download this, you can print it off, post it somewhere at home, put it in your Bible, but just keep it somewhere because you're gonna need it, friends. You're gonna need it in these moments of uncertainty to say, God, this is what you've said is true. I can trust in this because I know that you are faithful, the promises of God. Now the next thing, the last thing that we're gonna see in Jehoshaphat's prayer is how he just, he just humbly acknowledges to God that we are dependent upon you. This is a situation that we're facing. We don't have what we need. We don't know what to do. And we really need you to come through for us right now, God. So let's look at these verses. In verse 10, it says, but now here are men from Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whose territory you would not let Israel invade when they came here from Egypt. And so Israel turned away from them and we didn't destroy them. See how, not, how they're now repaying us? By coming to drive us out of the possession that you gave to us as an inheritance. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? And then this next verse is the whole reason I chose this passage for today's topic. It says, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. How many times have you felt like that? Maybe even this week, like, I don't know what to do. I don't have the power I need to face this vast army that's attacking me right now. I don't know what to do, but God, my eyes are on you. And I, I don't know what you're facing. Maybe it's something big, maybe, maybe it's something small, but so many times throughout life, throughout our week, we're faced with situations where we just, we don't know what to do. I don't know about your other parents out there, but I just feel like all of parenting is just one long journey of uncertainty. Like, I'm not really sure what to do here. Like, I, I, I've read the books, and I'm sure trying my best, and I hope I'm doing it right. I hope I'm not ruining my kids, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure that that was the right decision. I, I'm just, I'm gonna fake it until I make it, and, and most of the days we're doing okay. But then, then there are times in that parenting journey where you just, you bump up against something and you, you are really at a loss. You realize how insufficient you are in and of yourself. And you just find yourself before the Lord saying, God, what am I supposed to do here? I'm thinking of one very specific season that Andy and I walked through with one of our kids and I mean, we love this kid so much, and we just want nothing more than to see this kid thrive. 
But we were hitting up against some walls and we had talked to everyone we knew to talk to. We were using all the wisdom that we had and it still felt like we did not know the right next turn. And I remember just crying out to the Lord. I would go into my room in the mornings and I I would get out my Bible. My heart would be so burdened, so heavy. And I would just get down on the ground and I would lay with my face to the ground and I would weep before the Lord. I say, God, I love this kid. And I know that you love this kid. And I don't know what to do right now. And I need your help. And there's a song that I would listen to over and over again. And it says, God, I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You are where my help comes from. So give me wisdom because you know just what to do. And that is true for whatever circumstance you're facing. He knows just what to do. And so you can say to him, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And that's the posture of my heart. I want to hear from you. When Jehoshaphat finished praying this, it says that all of the men of Judah with their wives and their children and their little ones, they just stood there before the Lord, just stood in, their, stood in his presence, waiting expectantly for him to answer, for him to guide them. I think it's such a beautiful scene to imagine this collective group of men and women, this intergenerational group, children, students, they were all there together seeking the guidance of the Lord because they knew that the victory that they needed, it was not gonna come from their own cleverness. It was not gonna come from their own wisdom and intellect or their ability to come up with some great military strategy. This victory was in the hands of the Lord. Their dependence, they were dependent upon him for their salvation. And it's a good posture for us to be in, this waiting in the presence of the Lord for his guidance. Now God does indeed give them a next step. He gives them some guidance over in in the next verse, verse 16. He says to them, tomorrow, march down against them. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. So he tells them, all right, guys, let's go. I'm gonna go with you. And he gives them that next step. But did you you notice he didn't give them a lot of details? Do you ever feel like that when you ask for direction from God? You're like, oh, I I was hoping for a little more than that, God. (laughs) Like, so for a little bit more details, like, Exactly what position do you want me to take up? And, and would you like to tell me which weapons I'm gonna need when I go? Like, I need a, I need a little bit more, a little more details, God. But so God doesn't always give us all of those details. What God always provides is what's next. His word is a lamp to our feet. It might not illuminate the entire path for you, but it gives you enough to take a next step with him. I remember a few um, weeks ago, I was at Disneyland with my kids, and I was walking, or we decided to go over to Tom Sawyer Island, and there's this cave on Tom Sawyer Island that you can walk through. So it's not a ride. You don't like get in a cart and, and ride through it. You're walking through it. I'd never been in this cave before. There is one place in the cave that is completely pitch black dark, and I was like, oh my goodness. I don't know if I'm about to step off a cliff right now. I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna run into a wall, if a pirate's about to jump out and scare me half to death. I, I was like walking around through the cave like this and it, it feels like life can feel like that sometimes. Like we got our hands up, we're trying to protect ourselves from getting hurt. But God's saying, hey, stand in my presence and I'm gonna give you a next step. I'm gonna illuminate that light right in front of you so you can know that you can step out in faith and obey even when you don't have the whole picture. Now this story, if you, if you were to continue to read it, you would see how God does in fact give them a miraculous deliverance from their enemies. But I wanted to story tell it to you first so that you could understand that this guy Jehoshaphat, this king of Judah, he got handed these situations. He didn't know how to handle. He'd never been confronted with this exact situation before, but he was able to navigate it in a way that honored God and that kept the nation at peace. It's possible for us too. 
And so what I wanna do now is I wanna zoom out a bit and take more of an aerial view of what, um, what are some of these principles that we can extract from this particular story that would be applicable to us no matter what kind of uncertain circumstance we're facing in life. So get that back in your mind. Whatever it is that you're facing right now, whatever your family is walking through, whatever you're facing at work, get that situation in your, hand, in your head and we're gonna pull out a few principles from this passage. So the first thing that happens is that Jehoshaphat gets handed this uncertain future. He doesn't know what to do. He's got an army that's attacking him, and he has to decide in a moment of crisis, what do I do next? Well, his first response is that he resolves to inquire of the Lord. So he doesn't freak out. He says, God, I'm not going to phone a friend right now, God. I'm not going to write out my pros and cons list yet. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to inquire of the Lord. And when he does that, he reminds himself of God's power. God, you are enough, you're more than able, you have all the resources that I need. Power and might are in your hands. But not only does he remind himself of God's power, he reminds God of his promises. God, this is who you say that you are. This is what you've said that you will do and I'm holding you to your word because I know that you are faithful and you'll do it. So I'm waiting here in expectation. The next thing he, that Jehoshaphat does is he just acknowledges his complete dependence upon God. God, I don't know what to do here. This is the situation that I'm facing, but my eyes are on you and I trust you. He acknowledges his dependence upon him and then he just waits in the presence of the Lord. Now I know that word waiting, it feels very passive to us. Like we imagine ourselves maybe in a waiting room at a doctor's office and you're just sitting there scrolling, 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 and, and you're just sitting there waiting. It's so passive. But that's not actually the kind of waiting that the Bible talks about. Waiting is associated with hope in the Bible. It's an expectant kind of wait, waiting. There's a, a Bible verse in Isaiah that says, yes, Lord, walking in your ways, I wait for you. You see those two things going together. Walking in your ways, I wait for you. The walking and the waiting. So I'm, I'm gonna continue to walk in obedience to you, but I have this heart posture of waiting. And God, you always have the authority to step in and redirect my path because my heart is always waiting on you as I walk with you. So they waited in the presence of the Lord. And then that last step, which is so important, is that they obey without complete understanding. Without complete understanding, they, they obeyed. I think that all of us, we, we like want this clear vision for our life, right? Like, like this 20 year plan of this is where we're going in life and this is how we're gonna get there and we love clarity. But when God guides us, he doesn't guide with like this destination, he guides with direction. Like we, we're wanting specific answers. And God wants to give us wisdom and principles to follow. Like we want this email with like bullet points and an outline and a packing list and materials and all the things we're gonna need for this journey. And God's like, no, 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 that's not how I operate. I wanna keep you close to my side. I wanna keep whispering in your ear, this is the way to walk in. It keeps us dependent upon him. So many times we, we don't trust what God has already entrusted to us. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, you already have everything you need to live a godly life. In James 1, it says that if anyone lacks wisdom, we can ask God for it and he will give it to us. So God's saying, I've already given you so much and I want you to trust what I've already given you, trust it enough to take that first step of obedience, even without complete understanding. I know that sometimes it feels almost paralyzing when you're trying to hear God's voice on something and you're like, God, I am waiting on you. I'm asking you to speak to me. I got my Bible open, God, what else do you want? I need to hear a word. And we're just like paralyzed and we can't move forward. But sometimes when I get in that moment, what I'll do is I will just try to listen and discern as best as I can and I will write out a plan and I'll hold it before the Lord. And I'll say, God, I believe this is what you're directing my heart and my mind to do. But God, if this is not from you, shut it down. God, if this is not from you, close every door because I only want your will and I 
think this is how you're directing me right now. God wants to direct our path. He wants to lead us in this path of peace, even in the midst of uncertainty. There is a way forward. And so our team put together another resource for you because we like to give away free things here at Saddleback Church. And so there's another um, download that you're gonna get today when you check in with us. And it's like a pathway of peace. I want, you, I want you to see it. It's like a pathway of peace that you can stay on as you embrace life's uncertainty. It just kind of goes through those different bullet points to remind you that even though you cannot eliminate all of life's uncertainty, it's not required that you navigate uncertainty with anxiety. You can navigate life's uncertainty with the peace of God. You see, God actually intentionally infuses our lives with uncertainty. And that, that might seem a little cruel, but I like to think of it more as an adventure because the reason why God does that is he wants to keep us in moment by moment dependence upon him. He wants us listening to his voice. He loves us so much that he wants us to be in relationship with him. He doesn't want us living life by rote. He's saying, no, stay close to my side, I'll guide you. It's kind of like a kid that goes on an adventure with their dad. Like I, I remember when I was a kid, I went on so many fun adventures with my dad. He would take me horseback riding. He would take me motorcycle riding. He was a cool dad. We'd go exploring in the woods. And I never knew exactly what we were doing or where we were going or what the adventure was going to be. But I wasn't worried about it. I wasn't anxious in my heart because I was with my dad. And I knew he loved me. And he had a plan. And I could trust him. And that is what God wants it to feel like as we walk through uncertainty, that there's this loving and trusting relationship that we have with him, our heavenly father. And listen, I know that, that adventure, that uncertainty in life doesn't always feel like this fun adventure. But that is the heartbeat of God for you, that he wants you to have that trusting relationship, even when it feels painful, even when it's very hard to discern what's ahead and it's causing you a lot of stress. God's saying, hey, trust me even here. You see, God did not design uncertainty in our life to create anxiety inside of us. He created uncertainty in our life to create trust in this relationship that he has with us. It's a loving and trusting father that we can look to in times of uncertainty, that he's with us even in the midst of it. You know, when, when we were probably about two years ago trying to discern, Andy and I, what God was saying in our lives, and it, it felt like he was tapping us on the shoulder and redirecting us here to Saddleback Church, and we were like, God is, what are you doing, God? Everything about our future suddenly felt very uncertain, very foggy. And I, I just remember being so heavy hearted about this situation. And I did not know the path forward. I did not know what God wanted us to do. And so every morning, about 3 a.m., I would get like this shot of adrenaline or like cortisol or whatever that stress hormone is that you just like, you're wide awake right at 3 a.m. And, and it's like, okay. How am I gonna handle all this stress and uncertainty that I'm feeling? And I would get out of bed and I would lay on the floor or kneel on the floor and I would just say, God, I don't know what you want us to do, but my eyes are on you right now and I need you to direct my steps. You see, God is inviting us into these places of intimacy with him. And when we try to close the loop too prematurely, we miss out on that. I don't know what, what loop you're trying to close frantically in your mind today, that, that life feels uncertain in this area and you're just like rapidly trying to get it to a place, to the finish line, a place of resolution. I don't know what it is that's keeping you awake at night, but I wonder if it might be God's invitation to you, just like it was to Jehoshaphat, to say, hey, would you inquire of me? Would you trust me here? Would you just come right alongside me and let me speak to you to say this is the way to walk in. You see, God wants to keep us in perfect peace. And he wants to guide our steps. 
But if we try to close that loop too prematurely, then we're gonna miss what he's doing in our lives. We're gonna miss the fact that he wants to create this character growth inside of us. That I could have missed those moments in the morning with God. I just, I look back on that season, that three month season where I didn't get much sleep, but I got a lot of prayer. And I think about that intimacy that I had with my father. And that's a, that's a tender time. When you feel so vulnerable and exposed because you don't know what's next, there's a lot of tenderness there that the Lord can speak to you right there. And it's actually a beautiful place of intimacy. Now last week when Andy started this series, he introduced a lot of statistics to us and he showed us some graphs on the screen about how anxiety is just on the rise, not just here in the United States, but all over the world globally, that there is like this mental health crisis that so many people are dealing with anxiety. And so I was thinking about that this week as I was preparing for this message. And I was like, what are, what are all the things that make us feel so anxious? And the common denominator that I was able to, to pick up on is that All these things that we're worried about, that we're stressed about, they're all time bound. Because almost everything that we worry about and stress about, it has an expiration date. Because our lives have an expiration date. But there's there's one thing about you that does not have an expiration date, expiration date, and that's your soul. That when you breathe your life, last breath here on earth, your soul will continue to live on. So if there was one thing that would actually be worth having a little anxiety about, it would be the state of your soul. Like if there's one thing that would be worth losing some sleep over at night, it would be what is the state of my soul? Do I know what's going to happen to me after I die? And perhaps if we worried more about that, then we would worry less about the temporary troubles and trials that we're facing right now. Some of them very significant, some of them very critical, but in light of eternity, we remember that they're all temporary. I'm reading this book right now about a movement of God that took place in New York City back in the 1850s or so. And it is historically referred to as the Businessmen's Revival. And this book tells like story after story about these men and women so interesting how, how suddenly they would just be stricken with this anxiety about their soul, the state of their soul. These are people that were completely irreligious. Sometimes people that were religious, but then suddenly they're just not sure. They don't have certainty about the state of their soul. Am I going to heaven when I die? Am I, have I received forgiveness? And, and they'll, this uncertainty, this, this anxiety that they would feel, it would just like come upon them in such a heavy way. And you could see it in their faces. Like they were, they were just so burdened, so weighed down. Their countenance would change. People would notice it. And it would be like this for days, maybe weeks or even months, as, as they were like looking for relief. They were looking for answers, trying to figure out how can I know with certainty what's going to happen to my soul when I die. And then there would be a moment of like, breakthrough, when Jesus would come to them and reveal his love for them, reveal his forgiveness that he's offering to them, his salvation that he's offering, and all of that anxiety that had just crippled them about the anxiety of their soul, it was transformed into this peace, this peace with God, that they, that they suddenly had confidence, that they had clarity, that they had certainty that when they died, they would experience life with Jesus in heaven. And so all of that peace overtook the anxiety and people could see such a change in their countenance that their eyes were full of light, their face was full of joy. And from what, I'm, what I wanna say to you today is there are so many troubles and trials in this life, things that we can't possibly know, things that we don't have any control over, but the Bible says that there is one thing that we can have certainty about. There is one thing that we can know, and actually it's, it's within your grasp today, and that certainty of your soul for all of eternity because of what Jesus did for us, that that we have a God in heaven who loves us, and he took on flesh in the form of a man named Jesus, and Jesus lived a perfect life, a life that you and I can't live, and he died a sacrificial death on the cross as a way of, of providing forgiveness for our sins, 
a way of providing peace with God, a relationship with him. You guys, that is the promise of peace. It's that we can have relationship with God, that we can have confidence that our soul will be in eternity with God in heaven when we die. When you have that kind of peace with God, it has a trickle down effect on all the different troubles and trials that we're facing in this life. It's not that it takes these troubles and trials away. In fact, Jesus promises us that in this world, you will have trouble. So Jesus promises us peace, but he also promises that we're gonna have trouble. And it shows us that those two things are not mutually exclusive, they can coexist together. You can have peace even in the midst of your troubles because you have an eternal peace with God that puts everything in perspective. It right sizes the troubles that we face here on earth because we can remember no matter how hard, no matter how dark, no matter how bad our circumstances right now, they are time bound and we know that we know that we know that we have peace with God for all of eternity. I want that for all of you today. Some of you may have come in here today and you don't know with certainty that you will spend eternity with God. And what I'm saying to you is that the Bible teaches that you can. You can know with certainty that salvation is yours and it's available to you today. Our theme verse for this message series comes out of Isaiah chapter 26. And it says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast, those who trust in you. When I was in high school, I remember one day my mom wrote that verse for me on an index card and she just left it on my bed. I don't remember exactly what I was going through at the time, but I remember that she wrote it this way. She said, you will keep in perfect peace, Stacy." whose mind is steadfast because she trusts in you. My mind is steadfast. I trust in the Lord. My mom was reminding me of my identity, that I have the mind of Christ. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but I trust in the name of the Lord my God so you can come at me, life, because my God is the eternal rock and I will not be shaken. He's my refuge, he's my fortress. So I'm not gonna fear the terror of night. I'm not gonna dread the unknown because he is my shield and he holds all of my tomorrows. His word is a lamp to my feet. So I'm just gonna stay real close to him. I may not know what to do, but my eyes are on him and that's where I am going to stay, standing in his presence, expecting an answer and ready to obey. You see, church family, God longs to keep you in perfect peace. He wants to give you this peace that passes our all understanding. It's his promise to us, it's our inheritance. But what, Jesus, what Andy was teaching us last week is that God's promise of peace, it requires our participation. The, the promise is that he keeps in peace those, those who fix their minds on him, those who fix their hearts on him, those who keep Jesus in their gaze, who don't focus on what's temporary, but on what is eternal. He will keep our minds in perfect peace when we participate with him in that journey. So I, I wonder what your role is today. What is he inviting you into to participate with him? The, the worship team at all of our campuses is gonna sing this beautiful song over us about the promise of God's peace for us. And while they're singing this, I just wanna invite you, would you consider what is the invitation for you today to participate in the peace that God wants to give you? Maybe he's asking you to inquire of him. Maybe you need to get on your face before the Lord in some private place. Just get down on your knees and say, God, I don't know what to do here, but my eyes are on you. Maybe he's already given you some type of next step and he's saying, hey, would you trust me? Would you obey even when you don't really understand the whole picture? What is your participation look like in this promise of peace? I wanna just spend our last few minutes together in prayer. So would you just bow your head and close your eyes and let's, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to minister to each of us right now. 
your heart can be full of uncertainty and full of, unpeace, and full of peace at the same time. So let's welcome God into those spaces. I know that many of you came in here carrying heavy burdens today. And this is just a space for you to unburden yourself in the presence of the Lord. So would you just take all of your cares to him? Maybe you would just tell him right now, God, this is my situation. This is what's causing me stress and anxiety in my life. And I want you to picture yourself taking that burden, that weight off of your shoulders and physically laying it down at the feet of Jesus. Let him take care of it. I promise you he'll do a better job than you're able to. The Bible says that we can cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Right now, would you just tell him how strong he is, that he's able. Remind yourself of his power right now. Power and might are in his hand. There's nothing that you need that he doesn't have. Maybe you would just humbly acknowledge your need for him. And say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. And I really need you to guide me right now. Father, we just invite you into every one of these spaces, some painful places that have that are just opened up in our hearts right now. God, we, you, we've laid all these burdens at your feet. We just pray for you to minister to each soul. Jesus, would you just walk through this room right now? Walk up and down every aisle, every row, and just minister to the individual heart right where they are, reminding them that you can give them peace. We pray for all the anxiety in this place to be bound in Jesus' name. And we pray that it would be replaced instead with the peace of Jesus. God, teach us how to trust you, even in moments of uncertainty, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though we go through these incredibly dark and difficult places, we don't have to fear because you're with us in it and you know the way. So we trust you, Lord. I just wanna close this time before the worship team sings this song over us. And I wanna read you one last promise this one straight from the mouth of Jesus. From John 14, it says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You will stay true. Even when the lies come, your word remains true. Even when my thoughts don't line up, I will stand tall on each promise you make.
trust you, Lord.